Hello and welcome to episode 42 of the Clap Manninshire Women for Independence podcast. And the music there was copyright free music from YouTube and it's called Forged by Fire, a Celtic battle theme. And I think things are shaping up this week uh, that that could actually be quite relevant. And to set the scene, we're going to start off with what was quite a tetchy interview by Gary Robertson on Good Morning Scotland with Mike Russell about the power grab that's currently taking place. Should I say the latest power grab because it's not exactly the first, but this one is huge. Here's Mike. So Alex Sharma, the business secretary, was with us earlier. 111 powers the Scottish Parliament will be receiving, he says. Yeah, well, it's not true. Um, I have to say I heard Alex Sharma. He didn't seem to have, have a very firm grasp of this. The list of powers that has been issued by the UK government in his press release, and I haven't seen the full document, of course, yet, but the, the powers is simply, the list of powers is dishonest. It's it's one of the most shocking pieces of dishonesty I've seen from a government. So if it's, it's not a mismatch, how many is it? No, well, well let, me, let me explain what's in it, because in actual fact, what it could pretends to say isn't true. It's a mishmash of things that the Scottish Parliament already have, things have already decided we won't have because of the frameworks, and things that could be automatically overridden by the decision of the UK to take a power away. If you look at what we have, I mean, you just have to, I've got the list here, you just have to glance through it. Animal welfare, we actually passed a bill in the Scottish Parliament in that last month. Food standards, well, we, we set up a food standards body in 2015. But you're following uh, EU regulations on these well, issues, so no, is, no, it, actually, is it fair to say that you actually have the full of course, absolutely. Following, but when well, you're following course, EU regulations. Of course. Well, what regulations would you have, for example, in flood risk management, that you don't actually set yourselves and operate yourselves in cooperation with others? I was a minister, in actual fact, for flood risk management 10 years ago when we passed a bill in 2009. These aren't new powers for the Scottish Parliament. That is actually, I'm sorry to call it this, a lie. There are other pieces in it that simply aren't true also. Renewable energy. We've got the largest renewable energy, one of the largest in Europe. So there are other things that are actually trying to take away by framework, things like chemical regulation. So the list is wrong, the list is a misrepresentation, and nobody should be fooled about it. Well, what is actually happening here is taking away very significant powers that will have an effect on our daily lives, on, on our food standards, well, on employment standards, let me ask you on, about on food building standards. standards. On food standards, yes. how would it work if Scotland had different standards to the rest of the UK? as it works now, because we, we can set those standards ourselves for our own uh, reasons. So if we wish to, for example, tackle obesity by making sure that there isn't too high sugar content, we can do that. And you know, business has lived with that for the last 20 years and has had no problem with that. So if a supermarket so this is, provided this is something deceitful. that you felt was substandard, you could stop them selling it in Scotland of course, and it would be sold in the rest yes. of the UK? Of course, and that is absolutely right. If the rest of the UK wishes to sell things, which we do not wish to sell, they are entitled to do so. I'm not telling uh, supermarkets in England what they should sell. What we're saying is the Scottish Government has a responsibility for the nation's health. If it decides uh, by a democratic process that it should have food standards that are high, that should, for example, conform with European standards, because the UK, the England, will cut those standards, the current Tory government will cut those standards, no matter what it says, then, of course, we have that right now, and we should not lose that right, because that's actually about the health of the nation, just as the environment of the nation can be overridden uh, by these rules, but just as the welfare of farmers producing high-quality material can be overridden if the UK gets its way. Your argument over the last five years or so has been that leaving the EU market is bad for trade. So why isn't Scotland having different standards to the rest of the UK not bad for trade? Because it already exists and it is, it is a power that is used sensibly and proportionately. But why is the ban in, at in a way, level but not at a UK and level? Because those are high and, well, they're high and sensible standards and we all keep to them. There's nobody in the EU at the present moment, apart from the UK which has just left of course, which wanted to lower those standards and lower them dramatically and that is what we are talking about and the reason for that is in order to get trade deals which they would not otherwise get because for example the United States will not give trade deals unless agriculture is involved 
and that the U.S. agriculture will drive down standards. These are facts, Gary, and that's what we're facing. But so Alex Sharma said that standards the standards would remain high. Well, he was not telling you the truth because that is not what will take place. I mean, I've lived with this for the last seasons? four years. I, I'm, I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm judging them by four years of experience, and I do not believe this. And if you look at that press release today, it is a shocking example of how you wish the UK government wishes to mislead people in Scotland, journalists and the public, in order to get their own way. And we should be all standing very firmly against it. This was also a theme that Ian Blackford asked a very clear question about in response to Alec Sharma's statement on the economic update. What we've seen put forward by the Tory government is the biggest assault on devolution since the Scottish Parliament reconvened in 1999. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is clear that the government either doesn't get Scotland or can't even be bothered to get it. So let me remind the benches opposite. In 1997, almost 75% of Scots voted to establish a Scottish Parliament. The Tories at the time were hostile to the establishment of that Scottish Parliament. They were out of step with Scotland. Mr Deputy Speaker, Please a change. Today, the Tories want to strip our Scottish Parliament of its powers. Let's myth bust some of the lies that have been circulated this morning. Scotland is not getting 70 new powers. The UK government says new powers are coming on animal welfare, on energy efficiency, and on land use. Has he not heard? The Scottish Parliament already has these powers. Mr Deputy Speaker, just last month, the Scottish Parliament passed a bill on animal welfare. Last year, the Scottish Parliament passed a bill on forestry. Energy efficiency was part of the Climate Change Scotland Bill in 2009, over a decade ago. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have these powers. This proposal will impose what's been called a mutual rec recognition regime. The only recognition here is that it's a plan for a race to the bottom on standards. It will mean a reduction in standards in one part of the UK, driving down standards elsewhere. Even, Mr Speaker, in direct contradiction of the devolved administration and their rights and their powers. We all know how desperate this Tory government are to sell out food standards in return for a US trade deal. There we have it. No new powers and a plan to destroy Scotland's world-class food and drink standards. Not a parliament in Edinburgh of equals, but one where we legislate only with the approval of Westminster. I have to say to the Minister, this is not a good look. There was also an Opposition Day debate at Westminster this week. Now, I have kind of not been keeping up with what's happening at Westminster recently because it just seems increasingly irrelevant. But there were some great speeches in the Opposition Day debate. Now, you can watch the whole thing on Parliament TV. One of the contributions I particularly enjoyed was Liz Savile Roberts from Plaid Cymru. And here's some news that she brought to us. I'm great, great, grateful to them. I read on my friend, the, uh, the, the member Ross Sky in Loch Haber, for securing this debate. I would also like to inform the House that today in my Senate, our Senate in Wales, there's the first ever debate on Anibaniaf independence is being held. And I think the fact that we are holding this debate in the, the tenor in which this debate is, is, is being conducted, that it is fair to say that the scaffolding of the UK is strained to breaking by the unprecedented circumstances in which we find ourselves. 
And well done to Liz Savile Roberts for getting the Welsh word for independence into the debate and on the record at Hansard, Anna Bunyath. And it just struck me that I don't know what the Gaelic word for independence would be. So I've looked it up on my translator and it's neo isemilach I think is the pronunciation. And if that's not correct pronunciation, could somebody who speaks Gaelic please get in touch and let us know what it is? Because I think we ought to be able to drop that into the conversation as well. As I said, there were many really excellent speeches in the debate and well worth having a look at. But I particularly enjoyed Pete Wishart summing up. And here are some highlights from his speech. What can one say? (laughs) This has been an absolutely fascinating debate. I think we've just learned so much just about where we are with a chaotic and tortuous Brexit. I think we've also learned a little bit more just about what they actually feel and believe about Scotland. Can I say to them, can I, can I, can I, just take it easy. Just relax. Can I just say to my honourable colleagues across, Scotland is watching this. Scotland is observing all the insults, all the disparaging remarks, all the put downs, all the attempts to take a power, and they are concluding. They have no idea how this comes across in Scotland. And they can bawl and scream and shout and disparage, shout us down, ignore us. And all that that does, do you know what it does? I'll tell them exactly what it does. It drives support for independence sky high. Now let me tell them a couple of things, right, just in case they've missed it. And so maybe to help them a little bit in diplomatic relations, because this has all gone badly wrong for them. We in Scotland now are at 50. 54% for Scottish independence. Let me tell you what else has happened this year. Every opinion poll since the turn of the year has suggested that we are now at majority support. For the first time ever in the history of Scottish independence, we are in a position where there is sustained majority support for the proposition. Never happened before. And I'll tell tell them something else. After today, that's only going to go up. That's only good. We don't need to do anything in this place. We actually don't. I don't need to. I don't actually need to get to my feet and make a speech. All we need to do is to show their contributions to the people of Scotland. And so, all, 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 my main job as a supporter of Scottish independence is just to get them to make speeches like that and then show it back to the Scottish people. But the thing is, it doesn't matter. They'll keep on continuing to do this, and all it's going to do. Now, there's a couple of things that's going to happen in the next sort of few months in a year. We've got a Scottish parliamentary election in less than 10 months. If you think support for independence is bad for them, wait till we hear how well the Scottish National Party are doing in the opinion polls. Do you know where we are? 55% support for the Scottish National Party. Do, do, do the Conservatives want to know where they stand for this next election? 20%. That is exactly. Now, he said, wait for the date. Absolutely. We will take nothing for granted. And that is why I'm getting all the little clips of all those speeches and making sure that they're transmitted to the Scottish people. Because support for the Scottish National Party will then just go further up. <laughs> yes, of course. They're grateful for, for, for giving way. And uh, I'm very intrigued to know about the opinion polls of Scotland. They're great. But would you care to answer any of the uh, points that my colleague from Stable Trent North made about the record of the Scottish Government? Let, let me tell us something about the record for the Scottish Government, because this is going to come as a bigger disappointment to the Honourable Gentleman. Because not only is Scottish independence at 54%, not only is the Scots support for the Scottish National Party at 55%, does he want to know what the satisfaction ratings for the Scottish, for the Scottish Government is? He doesn't want to know. I'll tell him anyway. 74%. That is the satisfaction ratings for the Scottish Government. We are a popular government doing things on behalf of the Scottish people that the Scottish people overwhelmingly approve of. I'm not giving away the honourable gentleman, he took half an hour, so sorry, sorry. So this is where we are in Scotland, and I thank them. I thank them from the bottom of my heart for helping me in my ambition and my quest to deliver independence for Scotland. And it's so unnecessary, Mr Deputy Speaker. There's a couple of ways that we could do these things, you see. We could, we could have a separation of the ways peacefully, amicably, respecting each other. 
or we could do this thing about shouting us down, disparaging us, trying to take the powers of a Scottish Parliament. I would suggest to the honourable gentlemen, ladies opposite, why don't we do it the friendly way? Like, we now, you, I'll tell you something, they want the Brexit, Brexit, have it, please have it. If that's what England wants, please have it. I will be the first person to applaud them, to cheer them, to wish them all the best. We don't want it. We don't want it. And that's the simple thing. Why can't we both have what we both want? Why can't, why can't they, they have the Brexit, have the splendid isolation, have their fantastic trade deals that they've got in the bag? And then what we'll do, and what we'll do is reflect what the Scottish people want, which is to be an independent nation, an independent nation within the European Union. What my honourable friends do here, did here today was to stand up for their community, to represent their views on all this, to make sure that they were properly represented and make sure that their voice was heard. And they did a fantastic job of that today. And then, of course, there was the Conservative speeches. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more about them because it was great. But there's something I've observed. OK. <laughs> They're saying more. OK, right. how, how about this then? I've, I've been in this house for 20 years. And I've never observed a Conservative Party quite like this. It's the new model Conservatives, the, the Red Wall Tories, the Brexit, Cum Cummings Commandos, how about that? That's, that's the way to describe them. Or Boris's Brexit Bombardiers, how about that one? And, and they are, they're, 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 you can't tell them apart, they're, 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 they're all the same, they're nearly all male when they're all standing there making these same sort of scene. And they all beat the Labour Party and they're, and they're really thrilled about that, well done. Gosh, we, beat, we tanked the Labour Party ten years ago, I mean, like, it's, it's not a big deal or a big feat. And the poor honourable gentleman sitting there having to take all this. I, I actually feel sorry for him, but it's just... The Labour Party couldn't even be bothered turning up. It was just appalling. I mean, for goodness sake, they must have something to say about Brexit. I mean, even if they turned up and just asked to open a window or something, at least they would have been on the record. But they couldn't be bothered to even do that. It's really, really such a... And does he want to get... I'll give way to the... Oh, no, he doesn't. No, I... And I, I do really, really feel sorry for them. There's a one Scottish member. He's always got lots to say about the Union. He's, he's not even here today, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh Central or wherever it is. We don't really bother about the Labour Party in Scotland. Just, just like as we're increasingly not bothering about the Conservative Party if we were now beginning to count once again. But then, then there was the Liberals. None of them have turned up. So. No, no, but she, no, she made up time to make a speech, but she's, she's not here for the wind-ups, and that's as rather discourteous, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I say so myself. But she's, she's not here, and neither are the other Scottish Liberals who made a speech today. But the curious thing about the Liberal, Liberal Democrat speech, speeches was that they weren't, they weren't congratulated by these benches. They were cheered on by the Tories. They were better unionist speech than you lot. <laughs> the, probably the most thorough Unionists in the whole of Scotland just now are Liberal Democrats, and again, it's, it's no wonder that they're down to God knows how many members. But, and I think we all have great fun observing what's happening with the negotiations, these things that they turn up to from the EU. And we in Scotland, I suppose, are just a bit more dispassionate about these things, and we'll, we'll observe what's happening. On, on one side, we see the EU negotiating team briefed to the eyeballs intimate knowledge of every detail of the withdrawal ag agreement and the political declaration, negotiating in good faith, determined to protect the integrity of the single market and the institutions that built up over the decades. Then the UK team turn up and before they even had a chance to lace up their clown shoes, the EU are running all over them, clueless, no idea of what they want, and constantly shifting the goalposts, super state. Remember that? He says the EU. The honourable gentleman says the EU. The super state has arrived. And it's not, you're not going to find it in Brussels. You're going to find it at Whitehall because that unelected body that my honourable friend describes is what is coming Scotland's way. A super state. Remember unelected bureaucrats? Remember that one? We found their offices. They're not in Brussels. They're not in Frankfurt. They're not in Paris. They're sitting up in Whitehall. It's going to be an unelected advisory body that will determine what type 
of Scottish Parliament legislation will or will not be passed. The super state has arrived, unelected bureaucrats have arrived, and that super state's not dressed in gold stars on a blue background. It's coming to Scotland, presented in a union jack. That will be the arrival of the super state for Scotland. And God help them try to get this through the Scottish Parliament. We've made it clear. We're not going to participate in it. We're not going to implement it. We're going to do everything in our powers to thwart it. No longer, no longer will they impose their view on Scotland, a Scotland that has rejected them, a Scotland that has rejected their Brexit. Those days are passing. They are leaving. They are in the departure lounge. Scotland is making up its mind. Scotland is deciding that they want a time entirely different future from the one that they want to project on, upon us. We were going to make up our minds and Scotland will become an independent nation in the next, next year. All I can say to the honourable gentlemen over there, keep going. Keep going with the way that you speak. Every disparaging put down is a badge of honour for us here. Every time you talk down Scotland and try to deprive us of our powers, our support builds. One thing to you keep going. So from our valiant warriors in the parliament of another country, let's come a little closer to home and join the Clax Wifies in our virtual coffee shop. I was going to say, Anne, was it Zoom you did your, your 72 hour meeting through your conference? Zoom. Yes, it was. Yeah. 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 So 72 hours of Zoom around the world. Mm-hmm. No, it was good. I enjoyed listening to your, your wee... Um, yeah, but so what did you decide? What did you decide on the the changing kind of teaching and learning or learning and teaching strategies of, you know, what's been working well in different places and what are people going to try? And um... oh, Okay, if I can give you an update, the, the main thing that we talked about really was just supporting each other because everybody was finding things so difficult. So a lot of it was just a sounding board for somebody to say, oh, this is terrible, this is happening in my, in my university, or this is happening yeah. in my country. And everybody else would say, oh, yeah, it's happening here as well. And so that way, it, it kind of, you know, a problem ha- a problem shared is a problem halved. So it was a, a, a bit like that. Um, what did people think about in changes? Uh, I, I think for some people whose universities hadn't been particularly coordinated, they had kind of felt like they were on their own trying to change things. And so when they listened to other people who were talking about more kind of coordinated and more strategic ways to teach online or to organise staff to be able to teach online, they said that they were going to go back to their universities and sort of demand that they actually took that approach rather than leaving people to flounder on their own, which some universities have done. Um, so yeah, it, basically it was it was just a, it was like a a comfort session for most people. Yeah. But, then, but that's but that's good then because as you say, then people realise they're not on their own. Absolutely. When they've been doing yeah. it, and and I guess. It was a bit like when I went into teaching, all the, you know, they were, they were just getting all these Promethean boards and everything in, so it was a new yeah. technology. Yes. And what we found was all the young teachers, they were whizzes at that, the, the ones that, are, you know, they had literally gone straight from their first degree and uh, postgraduate yeah. and teaching, um, were, were like, oh, this is fantastic. See the day we had a power cut in the school? Yeah. Oh my! Oh, they, these they were like, oh, you think somebody'd slit their throat? I oh, can't do it. What am I supposed to do? We can't get all the technology. And you're going, yeah. We have this thing called blackboards. We have paper and pens. We have <laughs> absolutely a lot of what's been coming up um, about what's going to happen in England. A lot of things. I think they're going to force universities to start teaching online. Um, 
because a lot of the university's income, this is in, in the UK, a lot of the university's income comes from international students. Mm. But because of the hostile environment and the tier four visa situation, and the fact that universities now look like they're going to need a bailout, they're not getting a bailout for nothing. It looks like what universities are going to do, A, is cut courses, and B, force universities, if they're going to have international students, to teach the international students online. Do you know that's like a double hostile environment, isn't it? We don't we don't want you in the country, but send us your money. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's basically it. That's basically yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Because part, part part of the thing about going to a university in a different country is that whole experience of experience a different culture, meeting different people, seeing a different part of the world. Yeah. Um, no, I was just going to say, I just remember one wee boy in the nursery one day and it, they were all playing and he was combing his hair just like this and I said, that's very good, you're looking after yourself, combing your hair, why, so why are you doing that? Because I'm making myself look good because we're going on a trip into Aloha. <laughs> 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 the highlight of your life in Colson Norton is a trip into Aloha. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. So Anne, what I could, what I did read of what, of some of what you posted, um, I'm assuming it's the humanities and arts that's going to be particularly, in terms yeah. of courses. Yeah. Yeah. Ripped away. Uh huh. But the, but the problem is, you don't want ordinary people mixing with people of different cultures, because then they wouldn't want to fight them and they wouldn't want to kill them. Might like, yeah. see they're just ordinary folk. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anybody from the English universities at your conference? Can't remember anybody from England there. Mm. Um, there usually is. Not this time. There was quite a good showing from Scotland. There was quite a few people from Scotland. Loads from the European Union. Uh, in fact, Europe was over oversubscribed. We had hardly any room to put all the, the European papers in. We had some as well from Israel and a really interesting presentation from an Israeli Arab talking about the Israeli Arab education system, which is underfunded, under-resourced, uh, it's just horrific. Um, but looking at ways that teachers can actually help the kids who are obviously living in poverty as well, to try and aspire to something better, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that was heartbreaking, that, that um, presentation. Um, Australia, we had a good showing from Australia. Um, we had a couple of individuals from Canada and not as many as we'd hoped because usually there's quite a lot of Americans, some Americans, the Americans kind of withdrew. I think the Americans have got more fundamental problems to worry about at the moment, so that was good. Oh, and a couple of Africans as well, somebody from Nigeria and somebody from South Africa. Brilliant. I met a woman in Aloha one day, we were out having a week protest against Luke Graham and, and his uh, uh, universal credit. And I was just chatting to a woman who happened to be down here in the holiday, and I can't remember exactly where she was from, somewhere up north. But her sister, I think it was like the northeast, maybe the northeast, or maybe it was northwest. Her sister was trying to buy, like, you know, when all the banks were shutting down. So she was trying to buy the bank building. And they'd, they'd been told that the preference was for it to go to a local. And she offered a, a reasonable amount, I and mean, it wasn't like a giveaway, she'd offered a reasonable amount of money for it and had got it and been be told she got it. And then at the last minute it was withdrawn and it turned out it was the Danish guy who's got loads of land up north, you know, the one that mm. wants to do all the rewilding. He went in and just gazumped her by about, you know, 10 times what she'd offered. So there was no way that they could get it. Well, I don't know if it's not what if that's the right terminology to use, but basically, no, no, and I, I know that, but but even the act of offering more when a contract's been already offered and decided, I didn't think that you could do that. Yeah, it, the rules have changed because a friend of mine got be on a flat exactly the same way. Oh, for goodness' sake! Well, that needs to change. You were talking about the national trust, but um, it, there's, there's other people buying up bits of Scotland as well, other institutions. So the Woodland Trust have recently acquired a huge area um, above the village of Shieldaig in Torridon. Mm. And so um, I think that was with a lot of local backing, actually. Um, there was something on Radio 4 about that. Though. 
but it makes you wonder if you'll fill the vacuum of the National Trust. What other institutions, which, I mean, the Woodland Trust, as far as I'm aware, is based down in England somewhere. They um, are, and so they're, a, they're actually, they're, I'm a bit worried about the Woodland Trust. I mean, I am a member of it. I do pay them every month, but um, and I, I approve of what they're doing in Woodland terms. But it's a UK organisation and they were quite anti-independence. They took a position in the referendum. Uh, a Woodland Trust Scotland would be a much better vehicle, but they haven't got that. And I don't think they've got any um, desire to do that either. The UK have obviously got targets in terms of planting trees. And so it'll fit their target levels substantially if they can acquire huge amounts of territory up here and plant trees. Yeah, and actually about 90% of their, the tree planting is in Scotland. But that's that's how they're meeting their targets. Yeah, that's a good point. So what's happened with Neil Oliver then? Is he flounced off into the sunset, or did he get kicked out, or what? He resigned. Yeah, he resigned from the National Trust the day within two days of the Starkey. Yeah, the support and the... But I don't know if that then means the National Trust will actually get more support because they've had they've been advertising for it and they've used. Well, they've got Brian Cox as the, the voice to do it. And who would we have then? Could we not make them a suggestion? Who would we like for the National Trust for Scotland to be to be the president? Some guy called Robert the Bruce. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, let, let's just think about what, what qualities would we want that person to hold? I mean, uh, Anne, you had your post, I don't know, it wasn't about women um, and... Oh, women and Boris, women for Boris. <laughs> so good with his new haircut. I liked it a little bit longer and messier, but he looks good with his new haircut. Oh. His eye candy. <laughs> for, for, for being the president of the National Trust of Scotland, we've looked for something other than hairstyles, makeup, yes, you know, the external stuff. Yes. Uh, what kind of things would we be looking for? I think I'd like well, somebody who's actually a historian rather than an archaeologist. Somebody, you, somebody that's looking to um, sustain sustain the history, sustain these as, as resources, you know, whether it's learning resources or tourist um, resources going Some, forward. I've been watching oh yeah. um, Down to Air, which is Zac Efron. So it's not just for the fact that, yeah, he is actually eye candy. <laughs> But he's been going round, he'd met this guy, I don't know if the guy was kind of like food, kind of health guru, but they've been travelling about places, and so they've been to Iceland, and they've looked at how basically all their, en their electricity comes from, you know, hydroelectricity, the, the sources of the, like the thermal sources of the steam coming up under the ground, they, they're using their geophysical energy that's there to power their country um and even when they get the i'm trying to think what they were saying about some of the gases they extract some of the the gases or the, the like the carbon dioxide but they re-inject it back into the ground so it's not like going up into the, mm. the ozone layer or whatever um it, it's, it's really interesting watching it and then he, he went to france and he's looking at france where they have their I don't know if it's called, like, oh, it's, it's basically water of France, and in Paris, the water is all free. It's run by a public company, so there's no private companies allowed to run the water. There are water fountains about the place. You can go to, like, a dispensing machine, but you don't get bottles of water in it. What you get is an empty bottle that you can use to fill up water, like a reusable bottle that you can use to fill up water. So in doing that, nobody has to buy plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. They're saving a, a small, you know, saving the, saving the planet very, very slowly by reducing the amount of plastic waste that's um, generated. We also went to Costa Rica, um, a, a sort of community that live there, um, and how they just basically live off the land, everything that they've got there, they've made, they, they, they've even created their own kind of like sewage system where the solids then are settled down and used as fertilizers and then the gases that come off it are captured in big bags above the, <laughs> in this big giant shed and they can use that as well. It's just, it's just been really 
really interesting. But he also went to Sardinia, which I found really interesting. They were looking at the diet over there in this place, and they've got this... Um, there's these blue zones, as they're called around the world, where they've got a really high proportion of, um, what do you call them, people that have lived in cent centenarians. They've got the highest proportion of centenarians in the world. And I'm looking at studying not just the, the diet, the environment, the lifestyle there to see what's happening. And when they were chatting to an old man who's 98 and he goes out walking three times a day, he does a wee loop, but it's really steep. So the thing is, he walks down to the local bar, has a glass of wine, <laughs> and then <laughs> but, it, but it, it was just really interesting. And what was quite interesting as well was he said, so Blue Zones, how did they get the name? And one of the researchers said, well, I've been studying it for 20 years. And every time I came across a person who like, had lived a, a long time, I marked it on the map. I only had a blue marker. And then we started <laughs> looking at it. So he said, that's just how somebody said, what should we call these areas? Because there's like Japan, there's Italy, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of other places around the world where they've got these Blue Zones. Um, but it was fascinating and and what Zach Efron was saying, he's obviously been one of these like really fit people and had fitness trainers and they they're advocating a high protein diet and what the people in these blue zones are saying, no, it's low protein, you know, just enough protein and carbs and fresh fruit and veg and exercise and there may be a bit of genetics involved in it as well. In this uh, Italian place they traced it back to kind of like everyone in the population back to about five families from 500 years ago. Yeah, on, on that kind of note, uh, Lynn, I mean, this is, a, you know, much, much smaller scale. I'm not talking anything like that scale, but I uh, happened across um, uh, looking at a brew dog recently, you know, the guys that started in Fraserburgh. And uh, they've done an infographic about how they're moving towards a much more eco-friendly way of working. And it does, it just loops everything back in about how, we, how they're using it waste to power back in and they've just done all this connectivity so you can see how it all links mm -hmm. links up um and it's just really great to see and because it's right there you kind of think that's fantastic that actually other companies potentially can just learn from that they won't obviously all be in the amazing position that brew dog is in but the fact that they're doing that at this time as well and pressing on with it is uh is another wee light in the darkness i think they're brilliant they they did um they moved into manufacturing hand sanitizers using alcohol when the thing first hit i think oh, from that other places realized because of the you know the competitive nature obviously a lot of other places realized that that's what they could shift into and i think because of that they wouldn't necessarily have realized that they could have done that mm. otherwise which is why you've got you know places like sterling gin that took that move as well yeah. so it's great to see that kind of ripple effect mm. yeah um clever because when we no longer need as much hand sanitizer as we're using at the moment you'll remember these companies that did do that yeah and you'll think well actually i'm gonna i'm gonna support that i think it's been really interesting that on like nicola's lunchtime briefing she's been saying you know she's still very cautious going out there and everything remember the facts and uh, but support local support your, your small shops and things because remember they're the ones that when people didn't feel comfortable going to supermarkets they're the ones that have allowed you to you know mm. remain alive they be, they're the ones that have been feeding you yeah um, so don't just abandon them because now you think you can go back to the the supermarket he was in, boris had spokesman and said no no masks they're required if you're in a shop you don't need them to go into a takeaway. And I'm thinking, how does the virus distinguish between a person behind a counter in Pret and a person behind a counter in WH Smith's? Ridiculous. How, how do they think that anyone will not see through that? Mm. I mean, that's, that's how stupid they think the public are. Mm -hmm. But he's and, so cuddly, isn't his hair lovely? I love it when it's all messed up. Oh, he's a man as eye candy, Anne. <laughs> No, but what I did want to ask about um, grayling because somebody there's all this, there's all this stushy about about grayling, but actually who they put in place is a, is a right wing Tory, 
So either it's they're kicking up a fuss because somebody hasn't done as they're told, somebody hasn't followed their whip, and it's a control thing that they're getting. A control thing, though, to Larry. Mm. They maybe could control Grayling, but they can't control the other guy. Mm. Well, it would seem not from what you I'm just completely it. incompetent. Did you see what John Berko said about him? He was not looking back. I posted it on Facebook this morning. It went along the lines of Chris Grayling was the wholly inappropriate person to be put forward for the chair of this group because he's completely and utterly incompetent. In fact, it's so bad, there isn't anything that Chris Grayling has touched that hasn't ended up in a worse state than it started off. <laughs> well, they've said they're going to publish the Russian report in the next week. That's got to be a good outcome. The hysterical response from the Tories after that it's absolutely unbelievable. Well, oh, because they started blaming blaming Corbyn, didn't they? Yeah, well, they eventually ended up doorstepping Corbyn because he was the one that eventually got a hold of the leaked papers about what it was going to do to the NHS during the general election. The papers which haven't been disputed, but there's no dispute about the accuracy of the internal documents, which are still under investigation by MI5. They haven't found out the original leak for these papers. So they're not in dispute. It's just they got into eventually into Corbyn's hands, and now he's the one getting the bloody blame for it. He's the bogeyman, that's right. Corbyn is always the bogeyman. Well, the Russian connection's even more interesting when you start to look at their special advisors in relation to um, ongoing policy. So many of the special advisors are actually former members of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Um, and so they've turned the sort of Mar Marxist doctrine um, into the advantage for the Tory party, if you like. And this is the way that things are coming back at us now through these guys who are getting paid fortunes to work for the, the Tory party. And yet, this is a strange sort of irony of mine. They're, they're the neoliberals that they're using these former sort of communists. Russia and China must be rubbing their hands thinking, this is great, we're going to crash them good mm. times. Boris went on telly, just I put it on Facebook, saying that Really, by November, he expects things to be back to normal. Well, just yeah, in time I mean, for Brexit. Got, meanwhile, that you've got health services um, that are are pl planning for actually implementing plans for a second wave. I mean, they're not as much well, as. Well, I've got friends. We met people in Sky in October last year and got chatting to them. Um, really interesting young couple with their two kids, and we, we've kept in touch since then. And Brady had posted, he's saying, you know, you people, do you not realise that wearing a mask may be an inconvenience, but it's not oppression? Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then I've got a young friend I've got on Facebook, and she's adamant that she will not be wearing a mask. It's too late to bring it in. They should have brought it in four months ago. So for that reason, she's not going to do it now. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. No. You're saying they should have done it four months ago, you know, and I, you know, it's just like, oh, so start doing it now. And it's more about we're opening up more. There's more people going to be about. So there's more potential for you. I wanted to say to her, like, think of people that have been shielding, but mm. they want to feel safe coming out now. And one of the ways they can feel safe coming out now is if they see that people have put masks on, knowing that they're not spreading their germs whatever they may be. Well, it's you like, know, choose, choose your mask. Do you want the, the little inconvenience of a temporary material face covering or do you want to be on a ventilator? You know, there's two kinds of masks you could have. I did see a, a, a comment in a, in a post recently that said um, there's absolutely no point wearing uh, any kind of face covering because it will come through your eyes anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what I had tried to do on my wee one and the walk down the, the wagon way was to mention the kind of the links with Sweden and trading with European mm. countries hundreds of years ago. It's nothing new, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, Lynn, your Wagonway thing got a lot of response on Facebook and quite a lot on um, on YouTube as well. It was lovely. Tuleri, your little illustration, your cartoon yeah. for the podcast, that worked beautifully. I put it on the, uh, pod, the YouTube <laughs> film as well. Do you think part of the secret is the sort of timing of when you introduce the political part. So the, the way, like, so your one's, Fiona, you just sort of have it in the last, almost like 
20 seconds. Yeah. You, you come across the pond and you... <laughs> and then, <laughs> then out comes this outpouring of political emotion. <laughs> but up until that point, everything's quite sort of placid and yeah. normal. Lynn's one where mean? she where she got the dig in at Boris spreading his seed everywhere I thought was particularly beautifully done. Just in sort of passing, you kind of it's incidental to the main story, but I don't know. I had to, I had to orchestrate that. I thought about that because I was like, oh, I love the pond, the pond scum one. How can I do something <laughs> similar? And then I had to look up. I thought. I wonder how, because I knew that path had Buddleia growing out the wall, and I thought, I wonder what type of seed dispersal they use. So that's why I kind of actually, I actually, it was as though I just knew all this stuff. No, I'd done my research and gone and looked it up again. I was actually trying to find a plant that did do the kind of. This point that we making up, Simon, is that people might not feel that they are political, but actually the issues that are directly affecting their lives and will affect them in Absolutely. the future. Yeah, yeah. You could, you could call them political, or you could just put them in that box is this is part of your life so yeah where's a place where it won't stick out like a sore thumb that you're you're dropping that conversation i think, in? I think those ones then lead on to if you're having a conversation about this specific issue then you can put it onto sites that talk about those particular issues so you'll have those groups that are about supporting the health service mm. for example or yeah. you'll have groups that are, are carer groups so you might be having a talk about the situation that people who do you think it's interesting when you when you put things up because everyone looks at things from or not everyone but lots of people look at things from their own perspective and mm -hmm. so I had posted something about um, in France the them giving healthcare workers a huge rise um, and I had said because I want I know if I put something up and and compare it to like NHS. Joy always gives you an eye for saying you've got to differentiate between Scottish NHS and English NHS. So I had said, I know Scottish nurses did get a pay rise, um, but in England they just basically clapped for them one week and then told them to fuck off the next week, your contract's gone. Yeah. One of the other things that struck me recently was that um, a lot of things that gain traction stem from what you might call traditional street art, like a bit of graffiti or a bank say, drawn on a train, or mm. somebody's done a banner at the border, and all of a sudden there's a spontaneous reaction <laughs> to it. Um, so I do, I do feel that, you know, when, when you should think about these videos as well, but it's almost like you've got to cast your mind back to revolutionary times when people are confronted with posters on the wall in the street or street art or something like that. Mm. We haven't really seen a great deal of that. Um, no, we haven't. Surely there's room for that. Yeah, I put a couple of yes stones out at the the place I stopped for coffee and left a couple on the tables because I thought it's uh, there's enough. We were having that conversation the last time about NHS and things are doing the stones. I thought, oh, oh yeah, Lorraine had been saying she'd put a post about something up, and it she'd, she'd managed to get it shared about sixty thousand times or sixty thousand views of this post that she had, and she was making the point that actually just. We, we've got an astonishing reach if we just do it you know if we just even if we're all just dropping one thing a day in if if they're getting picked up and and shared and multiplied and we're all doing that as well amplifying it you actually can reach quite a lot of and i was looking at whether we could do in terms of the the art pages that um neil was mentioning there uh, if we did some process videos of the the stones being actually Put together mm. so that people then take get take on that journey of well because so many people ask about you know what gets used and you know, it doesn't doesn't matter how many times it's been answered does it they still have the questions about oh yeah the, that's a um, really good idea yeah so if there's a process video and then the end product is is leaning more in the direction that we want to open people's eyes to here's a stone painting tutorial or, or one that my kids prepared earlier and bring the kids yes in Yes, Stones doesn't have an Instagram page, but it does have an Instagram hashtag. Right. One of the things that is interesting at the moment is that the polling down south still shows, apparently, that the voter intentions for the Tory party. But in the new European, they've done a completely different sort of look at the poll, and they found that the, the red wall in the north of England is already crumbling and heading towards Labour. Ooh. Now, in Scotland, we don't have that red wall, but we do have Labour voters who are looking for a safe place to go. And I do feel that there's not enough effort to be getting these estranged voters onto our side at the moment. 
limp on for a long time. It'll limp on until the very, very last minute. Because I, 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 I cannot find the articles, but a while ago I read things about comparing what's happening in the UK now to what was happening in Eastern Europe at the end of the 80s. And they all knew for about three or four years that the game was up, that they kept limping on and limping on and putting out more ridiculous propaganda. And you can see now that the propaganda isn't even in the least bit believable anymore in the UK. But in Eastern Europe, they kept putting this stuff out and kept putting this stuff out, but they all knew the game was up. And it, it was just, they just, kept going until their very last breath, until it all finished in, in November, I think it was 89, wasn't it? So November in 89, it just got to the point where they just couldn't do anything anymore. And that's what's going to happen in the UK. Well, on that happy note, we'll say that's it for this week. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you all next time. Bye now. And